All right, this lecture has morphed over the years. It's kind of been one of my favorites because it helps us bring us back to what we are. And when I talk about leadership, leadership just does not start being a manager or having this title. That does not make you a leader. So there's leaders that are formal and they're informal. And what I hope to do is to give you some tips in our journey of overcoming the challenges of leadership. So the objectives are to examine current challenges. Well, that's not going to be too hard to do. We're going to discuss effective strategies to address these challenges. And we're going to summarize how, as clinicians, how we can be leaders. So effective strategies, that includes networking, uh, or the infamous term engagement. And as we say it one more time, what does engagement mean? Engagement means it's different things to different people. We're going to talk about leadership how we communicate. I said to my little group, we were all in the back talking. I said, what is the number one reason for success? And this is my personal belief. What do you think the number one reason for success is? I tell my husband that all the time, he's not allowed to answer it. Relationships, now somebody said communication, but you've got to have a good relationship to communicate, right? Uh, we're talking about recruitment and retention, like I've got a magic wand for that, that they're the only thing you have left to negotiate is is there you know, is it taking care of the people that you're charged with and taking care of the people that you work with that's important and how do you create a great workplace so why did you go into healthcare there is influences and there's reasons i'm gonna put somebody two people on the spot that i know real well janie who i've worked with for years why what why, why did you become a nurse what the heck I wanted to become a nurse when I was five years old, and I just, I loved my doctor, I loved what he did. You played doctor, Jamie? I played doctor, <laughs> and he was scary, so I became a nurse, um, but I, I had that passion from the time I was a child. Okay. And um, Brenda, did you become a nurse just to evacuate smoke? Yeah. <laughs> Why'd you become a nurse? Why? Why? I, I already had two kids, and they were like two and four, one and three, I don't know. And I thought they were sick all the time. And I went to nursing schools where I had to take care of my kids. <laughs> so when I found out when I went to nursing school, my kids were healthy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can remember, um, and I'm from, originally from Virginia Beach, Virginia. By the way, you notice my accent getting more southern it's because I'm living in Anderson, South Carolina now. <laughs> but uh, I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I remember I wanted to be an artist. And of course, what do your parents say to you during I'm a baby boomer? God, be an artist. You will always have. And I said, no way. I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to follow my passion. That kind of echoed with me with my son, who's a musician, those who know him. I want to follow my passion. You don't believe in me. And so I heard my own words echo with that. But uh, you know what's funny? I walked into the Paul Hospital. That's when uh, registered nurses wore the clinics, the, the hose, the staunch white uniforms, and the caps. And then you learn how to be real creative with the bobby pins to put the caps on. Remember that? And some of them ugly. OK? Uh, and then you went bald in the spots. You always have to rotate the cotton ball in the uh, body pencil. So we all, each and every one of us have our influences and reasons why we got into healthcare. And most of the time, um, I, anybody ever heard of Melanie Bates, codependency no more? I always tell people, I said, we're basically codependents, aren't we? We just want to take care of people. So networking is one of the first things that I talked about, how important it is. And you'd be surprised at some of the surveys that Erin National has done. It's really rated up there high. <laughs> one of the biggest reasons I love Expo, I can get contact hours. I love hearing the great speakers. I love this too, but I love the connectivity and the networking uh, with the individuals, whether it's our vendors and the people that surround us in this room today. Has this not been amazing? Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> But we, we network in the operating room. Let, let's say you get thrown in there. Somebody didn't just because just because they didn't update the present pre, the preference cards. You run to your best buddy who's in Dr. A's room all the time. You go, well, what do you use? I can't get this in there. What am I gonna do? Would you exchange with me, please? That is a form of networking. And networking is amazing about our profession. And that's really one of the biggest reasons we survive the relationships, the networking, and how we communicate with each other. 
So this is a surgical team's characteristic. Can we be apathetic? Oh yeah. Willingness to do anything they are told or assignments without the objective to work hard in long hours. Vet boomers are notorious for that. Oh, we need to do that. You know, we, 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 do, we have this guilt. So we're gonna talk about the generations with that too. You have to have as an OR nurse, the ability <laughs> or structure to hold your urine for long periods of time. So you learn how to be NPO past midnight or either get yourself an indwelling holy captain, right? Mm -hmm. You can have the ability to go without food for a long time. It's miserable to get, you get up here at six o'clock, 6.45, and you don't eat lunch till two o'clock. I, I like the ability to make excuses. Why do we feel like we have to do that when you're late? Oh my God, I was late. You're not there to tell me I slept. You're lazy, but <laughs> yeah, there's traffic. I couldn't get it because there was traffic. Oh yeah. Um, and the ability to say it could be worse no matter how bad it gets to run out of the air when a coworker complains about your problem. That was one of me, I had a nurse. And if I said good morning to her, I hold, I heard a dissertation for two days, how horrible everything is. I said, oh my God, I'm gonna hide. That's what you say to yourself, get out of here, get quit. The ability to feel bad when you're told it's your fault, when it's really not. You're gonna feel guilty about it anyway. I was like, I told Liz, my president elect, I would go with her to know her and she goes, you're making me feel guilty, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I'm going to do. Ability to become a martyr and save face and feel self-important. Oh, I'll do it. Or I love Nedra. It's one of my um, my ABPs here. I've had a meeting this morning. I have to do this and that. I get a whole list of all her do's and that. The ability to control urges wanting something that you did not make enough money for because we are low paid uh, considerably still. I don't care what anybody says compared to your duties and responsibilities, right? and the ability to not mm, and complain and to face many of these things on a daily basis and be happy and content and come back for more. So you gotta be happy about it, right? Is that not us? Yeah, it's us. So what keeps us in the profession? Is it salary? I mean, salaries are getting better. We're getting flexible. Yeah, and what's forced this is the pipeline of the shortage. We're, ne we're ne debating in the back the age of the average age of the OR nurse being 52. I think that's what we looked up. Yeah, and, and now today, the only thing you have to negotiate is, is well being for a lot of people because now the salaries with travelers and A, &A took a position statement that was very hard on it and saying, well, you really can't blame people for traveling. You're coming out of school with $60,000 debt. Now you can, as a traveler, dictate your hours of work, whether you're going to work weekends, all kinds of things. I, I wish I was able to download that video from YouTube, but I was so fearful of getting a virus. Has anybody seen it where they're um, interviewing somebody and he says, well, we got this, that, and then he takes his finger and puts it on his carotid to see if he's got a pulse. And then the next day, he takes a mirror and sticks it under the nose to see if he's breathing. And then he goes, you're hired. Oh. Crazy, crazy. So the salaries are getting better. But those of us that are loyal to a lot of our institutions, we're not there yet. I'm sorry. We're just not there. And I'm going to just take that stand on it. But we are getting into the ability to be more flexible. People are dictating their hours to me. And I'm trying to figure out how to make this work at my level. And that's doing things like I went to Ann Med, I've been there a little over a year and a half, and I eliminated call. I actually hired a call team and paid them more per hour. Staff kind of love me now. I'm not quite there yet. I'm still working on a differential. So I, I have a call team there, and then I did self scheduling with flexible hours. Three twelve, four tens, three twelve, five eights. It's just all over the board. And if you're a manager, it is almost impossible to fix that schedule. So we're being very creative, uh, you know, splitting uh, positions and everything else to do recruitment. And you know what? I'm not starting my OR till later. They come in at seven, not 645, because they're gonna drop their kids off. I can't afford to lose anybody anymore. So we're getting more flexible, but we're still not there yet. Benefits are, eh, okay. Our skills, they think we could put a warm body into that OR. I'm working with that right now. Well, I don't understand, Andrew, why you can't take that nurse from Dr. So-and-so's office and put her in the operating room and she's got to be able to scrub a cranny. I felt like saying, <laughs> seriously, I, I mean, Scott's real sweet, but I feel like saying, Scott, I'm going to put some scrubs on you and get, throw you in there after a week. I see what you do, buddy. 
Yeah, let's, let's work on yes, but li that's what Liz said. Let's work on your brain. Because it does, you can fast track. You know what? The hospitals that have like eight to 12 operating rooms really have a harder time because they have to be cross-trained in everything. And try to get them in on board in six months is literally impossible. Where at least you can start with specialized areas and be 30 and 40 operating rooms. Like I can specialize and focus on hearts the whole time. So that makes our skill mix very difficult, especially in the medium-sized hospitals. But boy, I can't say that in, in my decision, do I ever regret becoming a perioperative nurse? This has been a most amazing journey. I never say that. Yeah. So we can do all kinds of things. Here, here's our current challenges. We'll operate for food. <laughs> Does anybody know what DRG stand for? All right, stands for the revenue is gone. <laughs> and it is, it is absolutely. I mean, we're doing more with less and the struggle we get almost it moves into moral injury. Doesn't it? I can't, a lot of times I can't do what you want me to do with that. And COVID, uh, I always tell David, you, you, you cheated, you took that, but he always gives me credit for it. COVID has become the great reveal, hasn't it? It is, it has made us realize what we can do. And that's crazy because now administration has did it before. I don't understand why you can't do it now. So you, you go in there into the PACU. And the poor PACU nurse with a two to one ratio now have become a five to one ratio and the acuity is way up there and nurses are getting stressed. And the other thing with the shortage, my surgical techs, my first assistants and my RN circulars are stressed because they're precepting all the time. And the biggest thing is we keep looking at finances and I get it, especially for your non-for-profit entities, we have to be somewhat profitable to keep the hospitals going. Does anybody ever read Becker's Review? Okay, a lot of hospitals closing, aren't they? And it's a scary place to be. I think as being a nurse, and Liz says I won the prize here. No, I don't because Jamie's been a nurse longer, so I put you on the spot. I've been a nurse 49 years and never have I seen so much difficulty today in healthcare. But Janie, I'm sorry, you got me beat. I have to put you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have joint initiatives, DNV, Triple AHC, Quad A, CMS, ARN's uh, focus on patient safety first. We did that. And all this stuff costs money. You know, it's like my hospital. You're magnet, but we're not certified. Come on. All right. Well, we can't do education. What's the first thing to cut in hospitals? Right? And that equates to patient safety, now doesn't it? Okay, so the cost of health care is skyrocketing. And, and, and even during the time of COVID, just the cost of getting equipment and product in was astronomical. We had weights and all the things that was deemed not safe by Joint Commission and DMV, we were reprocessing ad nauseum, weren't we? We did whatever we had to do to stay safe. Okay, so increasing technology. You know, I'm watching Liz as she's sitting beside me text. All right, those of you that are boomers, raise your hand if you text with two fingers. Look around the room. Oh, you got, stop, stop. All right, most of us text with one finger. But boomers, Liz is doing two fingers and it's flying. I said, like, oh, you can text back. You know the millennial and, and Z and Xers, they can text at 186,000 miles per second. <laughs> That's the speed of life. I teach lasers. So imprint that 186,000 miles. So you've got biomedical advances that are it's robots for everything. I've got Mako and I've got two intuitive robots. I got robots everywhere. And then you got the pharmacy robot that goes around, you know? Uh, so robotic surgery, um, who did I hear, Charlotte? Oh God, we just converted to Epic, I feel your pain. Yeah, <laughs> a conversion to Emmer, Emers. You, healthcare electronic documentation created a mini great resignation. Does anybody remember that? Oh my gosh, I came on board and nurses exited out. And you know, because they said, I can't learn this. We were so busy, so, so um, used to doing things on paper and getting it done fast. It, I, you know, I love the internet education. What did we, we do, Jessica, with the internet a few minutes ago? We Googled to find something out. 
it got me through school. I don't know about you. I Googled everything. I was a Google master. Yeah. Do what? They should have been in Google Scholar. I was in Google Scholar. It's a Google. It's a form of Google. I Googled. I Googled, doctor. Okay. And then telenursing. Telenursing also. Um, I, I had my doctor's appointment. We're face to face doing, I think I have to go on a physical level. So we're doing all kinds of things. This is a nurse. Get on the internet, go to surgery.com, scroll down and click, are you totally lost Python? <laughs> so we're all doing this kind of stuff trying to figure it out. And lo and behold, if you've got some ache and pain, give it to a nurse and we've got every disease in the world, right? Okay. So the personal shortages, that was me a long time ago. That was at one of our ARN expos. I still look like that, don't I? <laughs> Okay. And that is actually K Balsa. So the personal shortages are at magnitude and low levels. I'm at 42% uh, travelers in my OR, not so much my PACU. I don't have that or my uh, SAC or surgical assessment center. And I'm 25%. We have a deficit and tremendous amount of travelers and surgical technologists. So it, it is very, uh, it's very hard to have that loyalty or that 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 culture that you want. I don't understand why your culture is getting so bad. Well, you're making people preceptors. Somebody's paid, getting paid eighty dollars an hour next to the nurse is getting forty dollars an hour, and you wonder why their attitudes suck. Come on, this is not hard to feel, to figure out. Okay, and then the staff turnover and the training. I, I don't can't quote this off the top of my head. I'm afraid to say it because Doreen's going to say, "Well, let me find that out on Google Scholar and see if she's correct." No, but I think it's something like thousands of dollars per nurse just to educate in turnover. How much? We should have given that to Pat, but I'm not giving you Willow. Okay? Willow goes with me. So there's chaos, uncertainty, unpredictability, and constant change. How many times have I heard my own staff say, I can't take this change. I, you're coming in here, Vanjie, and you're changing everything. And I did wait for 90 days, didn't I, Richard? I sure did. These are characteristics of the world in which we live now. The world of the future will be even more so. And if ever a moment in, in the history where a comprehensive view of leadership is needed, this is certainly the time. It's needed at every level. If you don't have leadership set leaders at the staff level, it will create a staff infection and it will permeate throughout your entire department, right? So what is leadership? It's a process where a person influences others to accomplish the objective and are direct in a way that's more cohesive. That's a leader. Leaders carry out this process by applying their skills, their knowledge. The secret, and I actually put this, and I didn't have to cite it because it was mine, so there, and the president's message. They already heard me like about everybody's laugh, and they, Missy's laugh, and good people in there. Uh, Brenda, you, the, the president's message has been painful. I'm going to tell you that right now. Uh, but the secret of a leader is the ability to inspire others in the faith of their whole, own high potential. Just because I have assistant vice president, or manager or director does not make me a leader if people don't want to follow me, okay? So this is something I say too. I have idioms galore, so write them down. Liz has been joined at the hip with me over the last, well, longer than that, almost a year now, and she picks up my idioms, but so does my staff. So I always say when something happens, if somebody you're terminating, Jane, Jane you and I have that, and I'm not going to tell you the name of the person, and Janie and I work side by side, and you're coaching and coaching and coaching. If somebody doesn't know why they're exiting out, then that fault lies on the leader. It really does. And I remember Janie, the, that person going to you and said, Are you going to fire me? She says, Yeah, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> so I, all I want to say is, and, and I don't want to fire her, you want to coach to performance. That's a leader. Yeah, not, and again, not that I'm a leader necessarily, but you can go ahead and call me one if you want to. Um, but the fish rots at the head. When an organization or state fails, leadership is the root cause. You have to lead by example and set the expectations. This is biblical. The first will be last and the last will be first. Absolutely. And don't do anything that you wouldn't expect each other to do, whether you're a staff nurse or whether you're a leader in the organization. 
So there are four factors of leadership. There's a leader, you gotta have followers, you gotta communicate, and you've got to look at the given situation. And a great example I'll give you when we get to the situation, uh, what happened just the other day in my office. So leaders, they have to be honest understanding of who you are. You've got to go in the mirror, and I got that from a cultural thing. I think we had a DEI lecture, and you go in the mirror and you look at yourself every day, and you critique yourself. Have I done what I'm supposed to do? It is the followers, not the leader, who determines the success of a department, right? And followers, there's different types of followers. They're the worker bees. They're the ones that are getting it done because they have such a high belief in you, right? The new hire that requires supervision and you put them with that experienced employee. A person who lacks motivation requires a different approach. How do you motivate them? And what somebody else's poison is another person's wine. Years ago, when I was at Gwinnett Hospital System, oh, they did not like this particular nurse. I'm afraid to say names that come back to haunt me. <laughs> and we put her in, in a person that helped turn over rooms and move from room to room and get set up. I had a, we had a, not, I wasn't a manager, then I was a staff nurse. We had a leader there. So you got to know your people. The fundamental rules of starting point is to have a good understanding of human nature and know who your people are, who you work with, and understand who they are, okay? So communication is a two-way communication. It's nonverbal. Most of your communication is nonverbal. Uh, this is why we count on three. That, has anybody been there if you didn't count exactly on three, the legs are hanging off? That's miserable. Anybody ever seen that video of, of different ways that you position in the OR YouTube? Oh my gosh, that is hilarious, watch that. But anyway, set an example that communicates that you won't ask anybody to perform anything that you're not willing to do yourself. Situations are different. I said situations are important. Sitting in a room and a nurse, fabulous nurse in endo, and I'm sitting with the manager, and she, she uh, has heard things that are questionable and behavioral expectations and starting gossip and, and, and not wearing her mask. I'm just not going to do it. You know, I can walk out of here. And she had her ready to write her up. By the end of the day, by the time the dialogue had completed over 15 minutes, she didn't write her up. And then as she walked out, because she's crying, the nurse was very upset. I went, oh, here we go. I wanted to cry too, oh no, because I'm very servant leadership. And as I, as she walked out and left, Heather turns around to me and said, did I do the right thing? I said, oh yeah, you did. You have to look at the situation, what was going on. We have to be considerate of each other that way and what is going on in our lives sometimes. And it's not always black and white, okay? So, boss or leader, what makes a person want to follow you? You could be an informal leader. Don't you have your favorites? I mean, Miss V at AMC. Love Miss V. If I wanted to get something done, Miss V did it, didn't she? Where is she today? What the heck? Oh, man. Yeah, people want to be guided by those they respect. They always respected her. To gain respect, you must be ethical. Don't say you got caught, you caught, caught in traffic. Say, I'm a bum. I overslept. I'm sorry. I overslept. That gain respect, you must convey a strong vision of your future and where you're going. You may not be able to do it, but you're going to say, it's like when, uh, when Scott, again, I didn't change his name to protect the innocent, he, you know, and he goes, with, he says something about, well, I need you to get, get rid of your contractors and I want you to burn them down uh, at two every other month. And you know what I said? I, do you think I said, I can't, I can't do that. Don't you know there's a search shortage? You stupid COO, what is wrong with you? I said, I'm going to try. I, I, I'm, I'm actually going to try. So that's that strong vision of wanting to move us there. When in reality, sometimes you know, well, you may not be able to do it, but if I go in there with a negative attitude, I'm surely not going to be able to do it. So a boss is a manager that gives authority to accomplish certain tasks. That's a boss. Anybody can be a boss. It's a signed leadership, signed title. This power does not make you a leader. It just makes you a boss. And leadership difference, it makes followers want to achieve high goals. So one of the biggest things in Press Caney we did is we collaborated with every manager, I have 10 managers, of what we could do to bring our scores up in these horrible times. I am going to give bragging rights right now. It just blew me away. Everybody rounded on the patients and the family and followed them through. We had all these deliverables we want to do. I am at 99 percentile right now in my Press Caney scores. Why? 
They wanted to help each other. That they were a team. Assigned a leader by your position and emergent leadership is influencing people to do great things. And it wasn't me, it was each other. And I remember our materials manager going, wow, I'm going there now. And it's amazing when they go in there and talk to the family saying, I am your materials manager, I order things, and I'm coming out here to check on you. That's amazing to hear that from different people in the department. So the two most important keys to effective leadership is trust and confidence. Being honest, even though you don't want to hear that information, be honest. Town halls, we have every, we had them when I was in AMC. We, when they asked me, I was honest. Effective communication, helping employees to understand the business of your organization, helping each other to contribute to your key objectives because uh, it's not, there's not an I in team. Sharing information with employees on both on how the organization is doing and its own, and their own personal vision, how it integrates with the missions and goals of the organization. So what are the principles of leadership, whether they're formal or informal? Know yourself and always seek improvement. Be technically proficient. Don't exit because we went into electronic um, uh, documentation. Charlotte, it will get better, I promise. <laughs> Seek re responsibility and take, act, take responsibility for your actions. I was late, I overslept, I'm sorry, I'm tired. I overslept. Make sound and timely decisions. Drives anybody crazy when we're dependent on each other as a team not closing that loop. Close the loop. If you can't do it, say, well, you know, I don't think I can do that. I'm not real skilled in that. Maybe somebody else needs to do that case. Uh, but be honest and true about it. Set an example and be a good role model. We must become the change we want to see. Everybody knows that's Gandhi. So culture and climate, each organization has its own distinctive culture. And I talk about this in bullying. And I'm gonna tell you there is bullying that's part of a lot of institutions culture, but it's a combination of past leadership, current leadership, crisis events that occurred, the history, the size of the organization, the individuals who work there, the perceptions and attitudes. And I'll tell you, culture will eat a strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You will spend 80% of your time trying to minimize a bad culture in an institution. Why did I go to AnMath Health? because when I walked in that door and I've always worked at hospitals where I knew everybody and I was going to retire, wasn't I, Janie? I was gonna be a good girl and retire. And what was the main reason, my husband's out in the audience, that I went to end them? <laughs> the people, people, they're my people. And I walked in, I remember going in, I interviewed on a Monday, got offered on a Wednesday, and. Brenda is my buddy in Atlanta. She goes, what are you doing, you know? And um, I, I came back and I said, we're moving to Anderson. And he goes, what? Totally against every core of what I was, and I did it. The, the culture is amazing. So culture is the feel of the organization. It's, and, and that's what sold me there, and the culture's still there, obviously. Activities that influence the team is how well the priorities and goals are set. We have to do this together. We cannot do it in a silo. It's what the system's recognition and awards. We have a stoplight reports. We keep the communication open with each other. And we try to do it. It's like when Heather wanted fans because her team and Endo were wearing heavy radiology gowns ready for uh, sea arms and stuff. We bought them little fans. And that's what people want to help the, that culture saying we care. Leaders are free to make the decision. Not everybody's a leader. You can be in the position and hit a glass ceiling and not free to make those decisions. And what will happen if I make a mistake? Uh, David, the fair and just culture of Emory. We talked about that in bullying, the cup of coffee conversation. I knew I was in trouble if somebody wanted to have a cup of coffee with me. I wasn't drinking Starbucks with them, no way. Okay? But it's just sitting down and saying, this is what's happened here. This is what makes me feel this way. The process of great leadership is to challenge the process. You don't want yes people. You want to inspire a shared vision. Enable others to act. Give them the tools and methods to solve the problems. Model the way. You know, I remember going through Spivey Station Surgery Center when I worked there. And there was a young nurse and she had very little perioperative experience. And as we're walking, a piece of paper was on the floor, she stopped picked it up and threw it in the, in the garbage can. I looked, I said, wow, 
And of course, the rest of it, she's got no experience. I don't know what that's going to do to us. We're not going to be able to get cases done and hurry up. It's going to be a burden to all of us. And I said, you are hired. Lacey, you are hired. She was a CB nurse now at Wellstar. So you, you just never know. Those are people that model the way. When the process gets tough, we get your hands dirty. Boss tells other people what to do. The leader shows you how to do it and gets in there and does it with you, right? You encourage the heart. Understand each individual. We're all different. Share the glory with your followers. And I'm a big studer head. I'm going to tell you that. I'm a fire starter because they said, oh, you never should brag about somebody else because you can make everybody feel bad. Brag about somebody else. Bring the level up. Bring your medium performers to high performers, okay? And keep your pains within your own, okay? So other leaders outline the tasks. They envision goals. They affirm the values. They motivate. Come on, we can do this, guys. One of the most the fun lectures that I did uh, when I, I did a lot of stuff with Fiedler is we would have roles. There was the fireman, you know, and there was the queen. There was the different OR personnel. We had to reenact an OR situation. That was hilarious. But that's what we do. Each one of us bring that in there. Explain to your peers. Now, don't tell them that. They'll just, they won't come back. You know, and I can remember at Emory at TEC, thank goodness it doesn't reflect you, you're the Emory Hospital. I was the TEC, the Emory Clinic, because I remember hiring 10 people, and of course, all my managers told me, we're going to just hire them and train them, and they're going to leave. And I said, if they leave, it's our fault. If they leave, it's our fault. It's, have, serve as a symbol and a risk taker and blend the continuity of change by breaking up your routines. So leaders arise out of a personal passion for a better world. They set goals through dialogue. They self-reflect every single day. And I know I've talked to my husband ad nauseum. I self I don't know if I do that. Should I say that? You know, assist in shaping ideas. And I want you to know our board of directors and the executive team, we call each other. Should we do this? Should we say this? Act to change the way we think, which is desirable, possible, and necessary. So leadership improves the process. We set a direction. We align people together. We motivate each other. And how can you provide leadership within your department or your organization? What traits make a great leader? That snail is a great leader. He wasn't going to sit there and be the escargot dinner, was he? <laughs> and of course, leadership traits, be honest. Be forward-looking, be positive, be competent. Uh, I'm, it's like my boss said, I can't believe you. You went to the American College of Surgeons, and then you were in Boston, and now you're going to Georgia. I said, I'm a lifelong learner is what I am. I, I can't see myself any other way. And probably 50% of my career, I was an educator. Be competent, be inspiring, and be intelligent. Those are the five traits strongly correlated, correlated with people's desire to follow your lead. Leaders aren't quitters. I can remember when I was at Southern Regional Spotting Station, um, it, it was a sad time. And we were going into chapter seven. And Kim Ryan goes, why are you so upset? She said, go over, cross over to Emory. We were affiliated with Emory at that time. And I said, Kim, leaders aren't quitters. That was the hardest thing I had to do. I wanted to stay and help bring that hospital back up. Famous leaders, what did Henry Ford say? Affordable cars for the common people. What did Gandhi say? Freedom of the people of, inner, of India. And Steve, with uh, desktop computers for personal use, Martin Luther King, racial equality, and Mother Teresa, the compassionate care for the poorest of course. Those were leaders. Right? So we can't leave unless we can relate to each other. What kind of challenges do you, do you present it's in your today's workplace? This is the first time in the history of the workforce we have five generations. I played havoc on my next podcast to find a Z generation. I want to know what they're thinking. Why are we not getting involved in our professional organization? What do we do, need to do to click with them? So generational differences affect our ability to lead and communicate with each other. So traditionalists, should I make everybody raise their hand? Yeah, yeah. All right, who's a traditionalist in here? Oh, I'm so sorry, Janie. I just pointed you out, didn't I? And I'm going to tell you all the characteristics. And baby boomers, 
Yeah, look at the room. Look at the boomers. Okay. Generation X. Right. <laughs> the millennials. Okay. They're taking over, guys. Don't trust them. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> and Generation Z. They're coming into the workforce. Do we have any Zs in here right now? Okay, they're gonna be very different when they come in. They're very entrepreneurish, yes. So traditionalists, I've learned the hard way and you can too. Remember these are just generalized characteristics. Because when I teach this lecture, everybody goes, I'm not like that. Well, some of us have a little bit of country, a little bit of rock and roll in some of this. And baby boomers, this is uh, very typical of boomers. Train them too much and they'll leave. <laughs> and Xers, the more they learn, the more they will stay. And millennials, if you're not feeding them constantly, they're going to quit. I'm serious. They're going to quit. They've got to have that challenge. And Generation Z, 40% of these little persons or people <laughs> want to interact with their boss daily. I'm quitting. I am absolutely quitting. And several times each day, 84% expect their employee to provide formal training. It is an expectation. All right, so a little more about traditionalists, breaking it out. They're private, they're the silent generation. I remember Miss Nancy. Uh, I think Miss Nancy was probably about 84, and she was working with me at Spivey Station. And when she wanted to tell me something that bothered her, she'd do it very privately. She goes, Come here. I go, oh, oh, okay. And then she'd get me over the corner. She goes, She really should not be wearing her top that low. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, they're very hard workers, they really are. Their trust, their word is their bond, and they like formal, oral, or written communication. Very formal in their communication. They are the institutional leaders. They have a great deal of respect for authority. She called me Miss Vanjie, even though she was older than me. They have social order, and generations may view this as a desire of being biased for their placement. They love their stuff. They collect everything. When I was a young nurse, a traditionalist, a lot of mainly traditionalists, if I couldn't find an extension cord or a bobby, a bobby cord, you bet it was in their locker. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, my goodness. How do you support your communication? Do the silent generation keep in mind their word is their bond? Face to face or written communication is formalized and don't waste their time. Why? Time is very precious now. Do not waste their time. Boomers, you're competitive. Look at Woodstock. Oh, my God. Yeah, you're the free spirit. You thrive for the possibilities, okay, of how we can change the world. Brenda's going to have the whole United States smoke free before we're finished. And then we're going to go to the bar and smoke, okay? <laughs> They're hardworking workaholics. They're committed to climbing the ladder of success, and they are the show me generation. Their teamwork, they embrace the team-based approach, but they're ready and eager to get rid of the command and control style of their traditionalist predecessors. They're anti-rules and regulations. Anybody who ever knows me in the story that when I get interviewed, I, I real quick at the end, I say this respectfully, I don't know if you want to hire me, but I will break the rules. Yeah, that's very typical of a boomer. Uh, they accept people on an uh, equal basis as long as you can perform like me. That's what we do. And we will fight for a cause because we don't like problems, but just give us anything we're going to fight for. Okay. And how do we relate to boomers? Um, it's important to keep our body, watch our body language with boomers because we, we will read your eye rolling and your, uh, you know, that tells me you don't want to do it. Okay. Speak in an open, direct manner, but, in, but avoid controlling language because you're going to piss them off, I'm telling you. Answer questions thoroughly and expect to be pressed for details. You can't just say, well, we're going to do it. you got to give them the why behind it. Well, why are we going to do that? Oh, watch. Brenda, you were a very typical boomer when we were having that interaction with a certain individual. Well, and you asked her the why. Well, what have you done? Why are we doing this? You need to do this. Very much a boomer characteristic. And present options to demonstrate our flexibility and our thinking. Oh, there's the Xers. Uh, this chihuahua is going down, I'm telling you, on that little C. They're very entrepreneurial in their spirit. They, others see them as being disloyal, but they're not. Oh my gosh, they're changing jobs every two years. Uh, and no, not necessarily. They say if you want loyalty, get a dog, 
okay? And the loyalty may be a two-week notice, and they're, how can they do that to me? They're very independent and very creative. They have clear goals, and they like the self-scheduling. You want to do something different? Let them self-schedule, okay? They love value to access and information. They want plenty of it. They need continuous feedback, and what is important to them is that work-life balance. This generation works hard, but rather quicker and more efficient ways to find time while boomers are working hard to climb that ladder. Xers are working hard to have more balanced time at home. That is an Xer. How do you communicate with an Xer? They love email. Primary communication tool or texting, if you can text at 186,000 miles per second. They talk in short bites. I, that's why I can't get, I can't tweet. You know, it's a memory. And Dina goes, Angie, don't tweet. You know, how can you put anything in, in the tweet with just no more than a couple of words, you know? They, they ask them for their feedback. They will give you regular feedback, share information with them on a regular basis, and informal communication style. Um, they, they, they really are. And I can remember being at Spivey and having a millennial, millennials very um, uh, com relaxed communication style. Uh, Lexi would ride the IV poles down the hall and going, don't do that. You know, just having fun. I remember coming in my office. I said, Lexi, come on, we got to talk. I had a couch in my office at that time. She hopped on the couch and flopped her feet up. But I had to realize that was her communication style. It wasn't that she was being insubordinate. It was just the way this ambulatory center ran. But these millennials need positive reinforcement. They're of the cyber generation. They want more input on how to learn. And they want the independence in doing it. They are very positive people. They grew up during a tranquil time and as a result are very optimistic about life in general. They grew up with diversity, more diversity than any other generation. Money is made to spend. Okay, there you go, my dear husband. Why our kids spend all their money, okay? <laughs> and technology is valued and used for multitasking. Use our action words and challenge them at every opportunity. They suck up learning like a sponge. They will resent you if you talk down to them. They prefer email communication and always seek feedback and provide them with a regular feedback. You can use humor, that's Lexi, and fun-loving environment. Maybe this is something we need to look at as we're trying to recruit members into our organization. We got to have fun. Anybody know you boomers? And Janie, uh, traditionalist, do you remember how much fun AORN was back 30? Oh my gosh, we need to go back. One of the commitments we're doing is we're going to try to have a party every single night. Just wait. All right, we're going down because there is no limits. Right. <laughs> Encourage them to take risks and break the rules so they can explore a new way of learning. Uh, Generation Z, global entrepreneurs. They were shaped after the Great Recession. They're motivated by the diversity, the personalization, and the individuality. They communicate in a style of texting. Their worldview, self-identifying as with the digital to advice. Don't hide their phone. They will have a heart attack. Okay? <laughs> and employees should offer opportunities to work on multiple projects at the same time. They're multitaskers and they can get it done. Your tips, partake in communication. They love their phone. Text. Learn how to tweet. That's my husband. You better learn how to tweet if you're ever going to be the president. I still haven't learned how to tweet. I tried, but I can't tweet. Personalize as much as you can. Involve interest and engagement. Be authentic. Don't lie. Or don't make excuses. Emphasize practicality. And this is the new one. Learn how to use Instagram. Oh, my goodness. So communication has gender issues. We know that. It has team environment and stress and collaboration. Communication tips. 90% of your communication comes from your para language. Lighten up your face as I'm rushing in and going, Dr. Mikey, did you do your HP? Did you sign that? And he goes, good morning to you too, Angie. <laughs> Seriously. It doesn't matter how you feel, it's how you project. You don't want to be that person that's going to Hey, start a, a domino effect when you come to work in the morning because you've had a bad day because other people are going to relate to your energy. Absolutely. Don't walk behind your eyeballs. Okay. So team members, they work and function as an intricate part of a whole team. 
the silos have to come down. And one of the biggest things I said in the research group that ARN has devoted to, to get in touch with what members need, I, I, I say to them, we have to take the silos down. Perioperative nursing is not just surgery. It is pre-op nurses, it's surgical assessment, it is PACU nurses that and post-op that discharge a patient. And trust me, you can't just do surgery and shazam them in a tube back to their house. You can't do it. And we've got to take these silos down and have interdepartment relationships with each other. So communicate, that's that possum, not an armadillo. Somebody didn't move it. I, one of the biggest things I hate, whether I'm a staff nurse or a leader, is when somebody says it's not your job. We have to be patient-centered folks. Coordinate your work and activities and share your responsibility. Doesn't matter what you So if you believe you can, you can. That's called a self-fulfilling prophecy, guys. You got to go in there with a positive attitude, knowing we can get out. Because your attitude uh, from a management team, I, Im imitation is the highest form of flattery. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude. The remarkable thing is you have a choice every day regarding your attitude that will you will embrace for that day, and you will permeate it to the next person. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act a certain way. Everybody goes, why do they act that way? What do I usually say? People change for two reasons, for goodness sake, divine intervention and significant, significant psychotherapy, and this is not happening here, okay? But we can't change the inevitable. All we can do is be responsible for ourselves. 10% is what happens to you, and 90% is how you react to it, okay? Has anybody ever heard the word sensitive dependence? And do we think small insignificant events affect our future or situation? Oh, yes, it does. If you think it doesn't, try to go to sleep with a mosquito in your room. <laughs> and kindness, I love this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. If you're taught that people will rarely remember what you tell them, but they will always remember how you made them feel. Pick your battles wisely. Don't initiate any unwarranted help. Treat everyone with kindness. And a football player, Adrian Foster. And I do believe that. So we post a lot of these things in the places that I've worked. So does the flap of a butterfly wing set off a tornado in Texas? I believe if you change one thing, if each and every one of us change one thing, we can make a difference. Okay. So how can you provide leadership within each other or within your organization, within ARN, within the Georgia Council? Recognize, how do you recognize each other is very important. Empower yourself. Do not blame others. Never cut what you can untie. I, my boss says, well, have you hired your people in um, SPD? I said, I got to kiss a lot of frogs first. I got I to gotta know everybody and, and learn what they have. And I have been able to hire some fantastic people that have no background at all in SPD. Learn to recognize the inconsequential, then ignore it, and be happy and share your joy. I want you to go forth and contaminate as many people as you can. Okay? So how good is your workplace? Do you know what's expected of you? Is there someone who encourages your growth? Is there a mentor? We talk about mentees and mentorship. Be a mentor. Guys, the experience and the knowledge that you bring to the table. 
Are your coworkers committed to good quality work? Do they take shortcuts with preps? At work, have you had the opportunity to learn and grow? So the nine steps to creating a great workplace, help people see the purpose, expect a lot, don't dictate how, be readily available. I want you to break the golden rule with safety. Get the word out in 24 hours and make sure people have what they need to do a to do a good job. Say thank you. Thank you so much for letting me have a break for 30 minutes. I, I mean, sometimes you need it, don't you? And have fun. So this was Spivey Station. Nobody wanted to come in and do our competencies and everything else. By the end of it, we did a lot of role playing. Hope it works. She's trying to get everybody to join in. They didn't want to. And here she comes. Watch this. <laughs> so what makes me feel good is when I saw this up here. This it place is awesome. Absolutely. Professionals no longer can think of themselves it's just employees. Don't go in there. We're not just employees. We're a profession. And therefore, it's important to have self-confidence and have a high degree of self-esteem esteem, and be a visionary. What skills do you bring to the table? What are you doing to make a difference in leadership? Be a professional who is loyal to your organization. That's hard in these times. Those who uh, are, be a professional who can uh, possess good character traits, Understand the four factors of leadership. Know your strengths and weaknesses. Be proficient in your job. Know your organization and go for help. Provide direction and goal setting and problem solving and communicate. Communicate with care. Motivate. Develop a moral and in and, and such that you help train, coach, and counsel, counsel and understand the human needs of each other. That's all we got. We're with each other more than we're with our spouses. There are two things you should always do in the place you work. Value your workplace and add value to yourself. And John McClain, who was our um, COO when I was at Southern Regional, he said, Banji, healthcare is a team sport. Absolutely. The summary is healthcare can be challenging today. It will continue to evolve and change. And we all have a unique opportunity to be leaders. Celebrate your skills because I know you make a difference. You make a difference with me. So become a leader, become a champ. And my contribution to diversity and the change, that was Nicole. Uh, she was in nursing school. Now, now I'm gonna get teary eyed. Um, she was in high school at that time. Nicole's now uh, 37 years old, Richard. Yeah, something like that. He goes, oh, God, yeah, that's where I'll do. But I remember her in high school, and they all do this little blurb of what they want to be. And she said, I want to be a nurse like my mother. The greatest gift she gave me was to replicate myself in nursing. She was in the Air Force for years as a flight nurse. And now she's the director of workforce engineering with Wellstar. So I am very proud of my daughter. Thank you so much for everything, and thank you for allowing me to be the president and coming to the Georgia Council.